All right, so um, this is kind of part two of my little chat. Um, uh, it's all unedited because, like Miss Milky the Clown, uh, I seem to have some mysterious uh, issues with uh, photo editing or video editing, I should say. Um, all right, so I sort of outlined in that first little video there that kind of my situation and kind of how I got there, very, very skimpily, uh, squeezed in two years of experience and weirdness. Um, I think, right, so what I should really do now is kind of explain who I was, you know, sort of background, because, um, you know, as far as you're concerned, I'm just Joe Bloggs. Um, right, so I would say that over the last, uh, I say the last 10 years, um, um, I was working with, uh, I just finished, I had about 10 years working in the youth field, I was working with uh, social services with young children. Um, and uh, adolescents, uh, young adults, and um, <clears throat> I was working on various projects to basically get them reintegrated into society, and get them a little bit more focused maybe out of some of the uh, less positive situations they found themselves in and uh, try and start to think uh, about their future and, and uh, those sort of things. Uh, kind of successful uh, projects, by the way, I, I want, in my opinion and uh, certainly on the statistics that the government put out in the uh, Richmond area. They were good that year. Um, I wasn't the only person doing it. There was some cracking staff around, uh, like Robert Henderson, a uh, person who's very much the backbone of this, uh, some of the new uh, uh, strategies that were brought in to deal with young people. Um, and I was, working, I was working like 10 years from there, so you know, that's probably about 15 years or so ago. I started, and uh, Robert Henderson just uh, saw something in me that that uh, uh, worked well with young people, and, and indeed I did. I, I didn't notice that myself. I, I just started there as a bit of voluntary work, and uh, ended up uh, working there full time, nearly uh, in a voluntary capacity most of the time for various reasons. But um, I'd done the job, and uh, uh, I ran up a lot of debt while I was doing it. Um, obviously, because I work in voluntary, you know, and uh, I had two kids, I was a single parent. Um, uh, basically, uh, I basically found myself in that situation, and uh, I don't want to go into that too much. Um, and it was a very interesting uh, time, very challenging time. Uh, but at the end of it, um, I got through it okay, and at the end of it, um, I was in debt, so you know I had to do something about this, and uh, I, I tried some self-employment, and in the end I, I got a job as a London dispatch rider, a motorcycle courier, uh, delivering uh, blood and all sorts of things around London, um, and, uh, and less less uh, worthy things as well. But uh, I basically was earning, you know, on a on a good year and, and there was a lot of costs unfortunately but uh, on a good year it was about £40,000 um, so that's over the last four or five years I was um, the recession kicked in my, my money dropped um, but down to 30 but I was still having incredibly heavy costs so the, there was much less profit but um, but it was sustainable and I had debts uh, you, you get debts to offset tax and all this type of thing it's uh, the way you work but when a recession comes along obviously that's that does a, a knock but a lot of my friends were really suffering but I was doing okay I was able to put food on the table um, I, I, I wasn't able to go on holiday last year but but um, certainly I, I had my, my bases covered and, uh, and in December as I was saying when when all this uh, happened uh, it, it, it seemed like I was being micromanaged uh, on the finances. Uh, not straight away. Initially, I just thought, wow, that's, that's heavy. Uh, but that kind of stopped me paying a tax bill that I had to pay. And uh, and that got me into a lot of trouble, a lot of pressure, you know, with, the, with, with all the uh, debts then. Um, uh, I managed to work a way around that around early January, February, and uh, it looked like I was going to get back on my feet again. And everything was going tickety-boo. Uh, but then all of a sudden I lost a, a job, as I explained in the last video. Um, so that was kind of my background. I, you know, I'd sort of kind of been working quite hard for four or five years. Um, I was doing uh, 12 to 16 hours a day, 
um, some of those years I was doing that, and I mean years, I was doing that for um, seven, six or seven days a week, and seven days a week for about one year, you know, about six months, eight months, was seven days a week, uh, pretty much. Um, no, I did take six or eight, uh, I think it was six weeks off, you know, on a, off a holiday, uh, but I did work all those hours for that period of time. Um, so you can see I'm quite hard working, uh, you know, I'm diligent. Um, I was paying all my taxes, everything was going okay, all my bills were paid. Uh, I had very, very li limited debts. The debts I had were supposedly organised debts to manage my, my finances, uh, much in the same way the banks do, you know. They, they you know, borrow money and they don't pay tax and this and that. Um, well, you know, small time self employed people can access that a little bit. Um, you have to end up paying some tax, uh, but uh, but it does help uh, the finances at the end of the year. Um, but I did pay some taxes uh, every year, some, you know, if I was earning low, then, you know, and, but. Uh, you know, generally, I tend to think that I was uh, a good, upstanding citizen. I think that's probably what I'm trying to get through here. Um, I've been involved with a lot of charity work, uh, working with uh, advocacy partners, uh, uh, voluntary uh, uh, sector. You know, working with elderly people. Uh, I've just done. I've done lots of stuff. It's, it's incalculable. I work with anything from disabled to young people to old people. Um, I, I was even doing a degree at one point in, uh, well, I started one uh, in uh, voluntary studies because I was thinking of voluntary studies, where I'd go with that. Um, but uh, obviously, unfortunately, uh, I, I'm not doing, I got into the uh, the youth stuff, just concentrated on that more. And then, then a bit later, as I was saying, unfortunately, uh, then a bit later, I went into the uh, private sector to, uh, to earn my fortune. I think a couple of more years I'd have been very comfortable. Uh, I would have had a little bit of savings, which I've never had in my life. So uh, that's how well I was doing, and even in the recession. So, um, so I'm actually I'll I'll jump to what I'm going to do next. I'll I'll give you some idea of what's happening there. Then, uh, well, this Iceland thing. I mean. Uh, I've sort of been had it on the, the, the cards for some time because I, I, I wasn't sure that it would get to this. Uh, but I think from December I was, and then I was thinking, oh shit, well, you know, this is how how the things work. You know, MI5 make a call to Aviva, who are the nuclear insurers, um, and they just cancel my insurance by text while I'm driving, which means if I got stopped, my bike would have been uh, taken away from me and crushed. But, you know, so they, I don't think they can legally do that by text, but, but obviously they did. There was no letter or anything like that that, uh, that allowed me to know that. They didn't phone me up like they normally, they have been recently, you know, they don't phone me up. So um, they send a text and uh, I think they were just, from my point of view, that was kind of a message, you know, about how they can, uh, you know, sort of things they can do. Uh, you know, so they could take your bike off you, even if you're insured and everything, because they've just got to stop the insurance and have a policeman waiting down the road with an AMPR camera. They pull you over, they say get off the bike, they put their bike on the back of a vehicle and in the UK they will take it away and crush it. Um, uh, that kind of thing uh, and also the fact I got three points for uh, crossing the line. Uh, I think it's TC30, I can't be bothered looking it up, um, but it's um, crossing a white line and uh, you can't make that up. Um, so that's for a motorcycle courier in London, uh, you know. and it wasn't on a bend because if it was, I'd have got done for dangerous driving. You know, um, it was on a straight line, and uh, in my opinion, there was clear space to get through. But uh, hey, they did spend ten minutes on an ANPR computer thing that they had uh, deciding uh, while I was standing in a you know on a bus lane, and they were parked blocking the bus lane. They spent well, at least five minutes, you know, it seemed like ten, but it could be been five minutes, a little bit more. And um, they were pointing at it and they were, yeah, and the other guy was, mm, yeah. And the point is, I actually have, uh, I was, while I was doing the youth work and all this stuff, I was, uh, I worked for many different departments, so I was constantly getting deep uh, police checks, 
you know, so what are they call C C R C P S C R S whatever they call them here. Um, uh, so a CPS, and criminal protection uh, uh, checks. Anyway, so I had those loads of them uh, every year uh, for the different. I worked in South London, in West London, worked for lots of different uh, councils and social services and police forces and with the youth offending teams and what have you, uh, and the courts. So you know, I was well well checked out. So, but I was squeaky clean. There was nothing on my record, so it come out to zero zero. You know, I'd seen them myself. You get copies. So um, anyway, uh, that that was occurred, and uh, and all of a sudden these guys are spending five minutes or so looking at a computer, deciding. You know, I don't know what they have access to. They obviously have access to some details on this system. Uh, I suppose this was after the Olympics, as uh, yeah, it was after the Olympics. So uh, it's obviously you know um, people that would have been on domestic extremist database would have been uh, kind of. Uh, uh, would, people would have a certain attitude about what they were um, occupied, poking the queen or whoever with a stick, um, all that type of stuff, uh, burning people's houses down uh, because they uh, torture animals, whatever it is that, you know, that, that they did. But they also, let's be honest here, they also target people who think uh, critically. Um, you know, I'm not saying I'm right on, on all my posits. Uh, you know, I, I've covered a lot of material. Um, but, uh, you know, from Fukushima to Sellafield to, you know, lots of things I've covered. Um, uh, so basically, you know, I, uh, I'm not going to get everything right. But, but I'm just, I have a critical mind, you know, and uh, at the end of the day, we can all get things right and wrong with these critical minds. But, but it's good for us to sort of um, uh, just look at the, you know, somebody said, makes a statement. Well, let's look at that. Let's, let's play devil's advocate, if you like, at the very least. Um, and 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 poke around and see see if the, those posits are right. It's kind of a, a good thing to do, uh, in my opinion. It's uh, to sort of crowdsource, if you like, in some way, shape, or form. You know, uh, if you have the peer review per, uh, process, but it comes to be, you know, the same people. Uh, you know, and the peer review process. You know, they found that seventy percent of documents have some sort of problem. Uh, some were outright lies. Some were just dece deceptive. Uh, you know, so and this was in a report that was done. So you know, it's very important that people have critical minds, and our critical minds used to be the journalists, didn't they? You know, they used to be, uh, used to be the uh, uh, the sort of uh, cutting edge documentaries we used to see on the TV. We don't see them anymore, had you noticed. Um, but um, nor do we see the the cutting edge journalism. Some stuff from the Guardian stable, um, you know, even now and again, you know, people like Daily Mail or whoever come out with the odd story but you know considering that you know I can't keep up and other bloggers can't keep up with the news that's coming out it's just so much uh, we try and report as much of all the little devious and secretive things that are going on but uh, you know it's, it's very hard to keep up with it you know um, because what we're doing what us few people are doing you know I know a hundred or so or whatever people that are trying to get this information get it out to you um, you know they're basically being you know the they are taking on the work of whole departments of different newspapers from all over the world who, who you know, and I've talked to journalists, right, and I had a most interesting conversation was with one journalist who did a story uh, bashing the uh, union, the uh, uranium company, who shall remain nameless for now. And uh, basically they, he said basically that he had to pull a story because uh, they had the legal department straight away and it was so heavy and they were costing the newspaper so much that that uh, that he couldn't afford to keep trying to put these stories up because his he would lose his job basically he would because they couldn't afford to keep him on because they would be cost he would be costing them a lot in uh, in in uh, the, the, the sort of uh, legal claims um, and in the time of austerity of course you you can't afford legal claims so the more more the austerity comes in the more power the corporations have anyway so uh, so where we are now where we are now is that, that, that is down to bloggers and that's why I'm prepared to go to Iceland I'm not going to back off you know which I'm, I presume MFO want me to do I'm going to, I'm going to actually take it further and I'm going to spend more time I'm going to try and become a good journalist so that you guys can can uh, you know get a sort of a story that's not too technical you know and I'm just going to put my point of view down 
with a view with links and things and let you do the research and i'm just going to get this point of view because I've got, I've got some stuff in my head and i think it's worth talking about i mean it was worth 